So this just in, ordered from eBay, delivered from China. I ordered five of these chips on an auction. I think I paid about 20 bucks for this, including shipping. And I consider that a good enough deal. And if it doesn't work, I can always scrap it and move on. Lesson learned. And normally, I don't buy chips this way. I usually get them from like DigiKey or Mauser or something like that. Because, I mean, I just don't, I don't have time <laughs> to clown around with, you know, broken, bad, counterfeit chips and stuff like that. The vendor that sold these uh, had like 9,000 reviews with 99% positive rating or whatever. I thought I'd give it a try. So I would have wished for better packaging, maybe, but I think this will be okay. At least they got all the pins together and there's five in here. So it's not like the pins all get bent over against the outside of the box. Maybe some desiccants would have been nice, <laughs> but okay, whatever. I can't expect, you know, humidity controlled vacuum packaging for <laughs> 30 year old parts uh, bought on eBay. Here's a bit of a closer, closer up look. I don't know what date code 2055 is. I thought these went out of manufacture in like 1990. Eh, I don't know. They don't look too bad. At least they look, they look like the uh, TI chips from that era. Oh, this has also just arrived from Equatorial Guinea imported <laughs> all right so uh this hopefully is the dram to go along with the video display processor chips Woo! here we are one two three four five big ones right, let's have a look see those are what they look like upside down <laughs> and this is what they look like out of focus. <laughs> All right, here's the other bench camera. A little closer shot at the 4416 15NL. Assuming these chips work, uh, let's have a look, see at their pins and stuff like that. I don't see any solder. Doesn't look like they cleaned anything off of there. These are from Singapore. The highest quality in circuit manufacturing they look very clean i think they said that these were new old stock or something like that i don't know we'll find out 4416 so this is a four bit wide data bus so i only need two of these chips to team up with the 9118s and um there's a lot of talk right now on the internet a lot of people using these chips the 9918s but these are designed to be teamed up with eight uh, one bit DRAMs. Okay. I'm not sure I want to try these. Uh, you can also find some circuitry out there where they interface these to static RAMs using like two or three uh, additional chips, you know, uh, then plus the, the static RAM in order to make these things work. But these are basically the same price. So I got them both just in case. I don't know, 20 bucks. I don't care. And then a bunch of these things, all this stuff on eBay. Hopefully they're all, you know, functional. Now in the end, one of these and two of these for the whole circuit seems like a pretty reasonable thing to do. That brings up another point. Should I just stick the chips in a breadboard here and wire it up? I, I mean, I, maybe I could. I at least power the thing on and see if it generates the, uh, the video carrier coming out of it or something and maybe diddle with it with this or my Z80 retro board. I could use the uh, the IO port pins here, or I could rig up something on this connector there. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I could do that again, just to see if this will generate the proper output um, video signal. Now, here's a picture from an article with a similar chip, a 9918, written by Steve Ciarcia in 1982 Byte Magazine, part of the circuit seller series that he did back then. This article here is about how to create <laughs> what was at the time a high resolution uh, color graphics card 
This one was obviously uh, designed to go into a uh, an Apple. And what does he do? He's running a logo on it, I guess. And he talks about how this chip works, the TMS9918. The 9118 is a newer chip than the 99. I don't know why they went backwards in their numbers, just to confuse me personally. That, that's my theory. And I'm going with it, Tear. Uh, okay, so he talks about this card that he's building and how the thing works. And this is right out of the data sheet uh, on the chip, as is this, how the sprites work, how the layering works on here and all this stuff. And as you saw in that photo, here's some, you know, graphic shots that he took off some screen in his lab or whatever, how the bit patterns work. This is all out of the data sheet for the 99. Uh, 18 and uh, here's the schematic he used he's got eight uh, dynamic RAM chips on here 16k bits by one and they connect up to the video display processor he's got a 2222 over here looks like an emitter follower to give himself a lower impedance uh, output drive because uh, composite video, which, you know, is unfortunately, that's what we were dealing with back in those days. Uh, there's going to be a 75 ohm input uh, termination on the monitor. And that's not just a composite input of 75 ohm termination. So does VGA and stuff like that. Uh, what's unfortunate is that it's composite video. <laughs> so uh, unless you've got an older TV around. Or, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, your, your regular TVs sometimes, even today, still have a composite video input on them for backward compatibility, probably due to FCC rules, at least in the U.S., where well, they probably still require that on even today's TVs. So uh, the idea is you, you run you know, this, this, this very specific frequency. The chip does everything, which is pretty cool. It, 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 it takes digital DRAM uh, with refresh, all that's built into the chip. All the thing uh, you need is to make sure you can drive enough current to come out to your screen. There's variations of this chip uh, for like PAL output. Another one that'll do like, uh, I don't know if it's uh, YPBPR or just RGB or whatever. Like, point is, there's a couple of different versions of these. Uh, in the US, we would use composite, obviously, especially back in the, in the mid early 80s. The way this chip is set up is you hook up a DRAM with 16K on it. And then these data lines over here hook up to your CPU. So your CPU doesn't share direct access with the memory at all. So you don't have to synchronize any of this, which is real useful. So this chip is a pretty nice, uh, it, you know, this is the kitchen sink back in the day. This was a really nice thing to use. It just looks like an I.O. device from the perspective of your CPU. And it really only needs, I don't know, does it need two addresses or four, I think. It has a read and a write and a mode bit. Yeah, it has uh, two two different um, uh, one byte wide values. And that's it. <laughs> Give it a read strobe, a write strobe, and whether you're dealing with register A or register B with this mode input here, it can generate interrupts going back to your uh, CPU if you want to get, you know, like a, an interrupt every time you're in the vertical retrace or something like that. So you can synchronize your um, uh, your CPU work and updates to the graphics on a per frame basis if you want. And that's all you got to do with this thing. So if you look at this photograph, this is a 9918. You've got eight dynamic RAM chips here that are one bit wide. The 9118, you only need two dynamic RAM chips. It's 16K by four. And that's why I got the 9118. The other thing I like about the 9118, and more specifically, the uh, 16K by four bit DRAMs, is they operate on five volts only. These DRAMs need like five volts and like minus five and plus 12. These, blech, I don't want to deal with this garbage, okay? He's got a couple of extra capacitors over here, probably dealing, I, I, I never actually owned an Apple. I'm not that familiar with the bus, but I'll put it as plus and minus voltages and things like that because I'm sure it had DRAM on the motherboard as well. I mean, this is what everybody did back in those days. I don't want to deal with that. 
Yes, I've seen the articles of people hook up static ramps to these things as well, and that would be nice and easy too, but it takes three latches plus some control gates in addition to the static ram to operate it that way. If 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 my 9118s work, I just take the 9118 two DRAM chips and I'm done with everything. <laughs> so it's actually cheaper and easier uh to deal with if that in fact, does work, and I don't end up with weird counterfeit chips or something like that. Anyway, mine look exactly like this, so either they did a good job of painting them up, or uh, they're legit. I mean, it is the same uh, injection mold for the plastic parts and stuff like that, so who knows? Maybe it works. Uh, let's. Uh, I'll keep my fingers crossed. So anyway, he then goes on and talks about how to, how, you know, some test programs that he wrote and how the chip works. And I'll try that out if mine boots up and gives me anything on the screen. And there's his Apple, of course, along with his composite monitor with his sprites uh, zooming around on the screen. So I figured this would be kind of fun to see if I could try one of these and build one that goes on my uh, Z80 retro board. I mean, the only thing that I'm aware of that's a risk would be. I'm not familiar with the timing needs of this chip yet. <laughs> uh, uh, if I'm running the Z80 Retro at 10 megahertz, I mean, nothing ran at 10 megahertz back in those days. This may not be able to deal with uh, that kind of speed. So, I mean, if that happens, I'll just change the clock out on the Retro and run it slower until the thing wakes up. Now for the problems. Uh, Googling around the Internet, the best I could come up with for a data sheet for the 9118 includes chapter four. You know, I don't have the whole manual for the 9918. Fortunately, I guess it does have the timing details buried in here somewhere. What I would like very much to see is the pinout of the chip. <laughs> Because, you know, that's kind of important, too, people. It's not in here. I already scanned the whole thing. So uh, what do we got here? Uh, look up 0, 30, 30, 100 nano. Data setup time before the... That's an eternity. <laughs> yeah, 200 nano. Pulse duration of CSW low. Yeah, this is not going to go very fast. I, like I said, we'll have to add up what's happening with the retro board. It's been a while since I looked at my timing numbers, and we were cutting it kind of close as it is with the uh, 50 and 70 nanosecond memories that are on there. So this these numbers are outrageous. So I may have to run the retro at more like 2 megahertz or maybe 4, I don't know, in order to achieve these kind of numbers if the chip uh, poops out on me or something like that. Not that I expect to spend a lot of time, you know, using this and watching <laughs> my video on a composite screen. Honestly, the reason I'm dabbling around with this is to poke around and see how it feels to try and use a video interface that works in this fashion. All right, because what I'm thinking about doing is making my own uh, with either CPLDs or an FPGA. Honestly, I'd much rather use an FPGA than anything else. Uh, programming the other things and stuff with all the IDEs and the toolkits. I, I don't do Windows. In case you haven't noticed, I'm a I'm a Linux guy. And a lot of the toolkits want to run on Windows these days. I suspect we're starting to see some pressure on various manufacturers to try and move on to Macs and Linux systems. So maybe that won't stay that way forever. But today that does, uh, you know, kind of seem to be the case. Let me know what you think. You know, I mean, I like the retro projects. I, you know, I love the era. The chips are real easy to work with but as soon as you move into the modern stuff with the high pitch surface mount stuff it doesn't really bother me that much i'm willing to go you know and figure out how to solder them in but i've gotten a lot of emails from people that are making retro boards and uh, they're having a lot of fun with it and some of the people that had trouble getting theirs to work are having trouble with soldering and stuff and you you, know, you saw me having trouble with a darn sd card <laughs> <laughs> the big metal case on those, I didn't get enough heat, I guess, on it 
But, you know, soldering can be a problem, and the difficulty goes way up when you're dealing with half-millimeter pitch uh, leads, you know. So, uh, you know, I don't know. Certainly, if if, if that's your game, we can uh, try and make one of these things. It shouldn't cost diddly squat when you're only going to lay down three or four chips. I mean, I'll have to decode the uh, the address bus or something on the board and then uh, throw the chip on with its two DRAMs and a, and a crystal, of course. And that's about it, really. Uh, in his schematic, he drew up a transistor to drive the composite video. Makes me wonder if we're looking at a prototype here before he added that, because I don't see a 2N2222 anywhere. It would be pretty obvious to find. That's a adjustable capacitor. And those are going to be the teeny caps for the crystal. Hmm. Must be an early prototype. It doesn't even have a solder mask. But then again, a lot of boards didn't have solder masks back in those days. This is what a lot of boards look like. Of course, these are not gold down here, and they would have been gold. Uh, mo if he wanted to sell it, because this would just, you know, uh, oxidize very quickly and become incre incredibly unreliable. This must be an early prototype. What do you think? We might be able to do some sort of simple tile graphics games or something with it. I don't know. I always thought it'd be fun to try one of those. Certainly a breakout game should be doable with this. Um, you know, this is 10 tons of overkill for breakout, but you know, it's an easy enough game or pong, something simple for a first draft and, uh, go from there. What do you think? Thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.